It's a beautiful Thursday morning here in Lagos. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the program. I am Nifemi Oguntoye. Now, it's a known fact that at the heart of representative democracy, uh, no doubt, is the electoral practice, the electoral exercise itself. And it's important for us to begin to talk about the importance of people in the process. It means that every government gets its legitimacy by getting approval of majority of the people. So if democracy is based on the principle that the people must participate and must be involved, it's important for us to turn our attention to the protection of human rights. And we're beginning to look at how that fared in the just concluded 2019 general election. As we speak right now, the 2019 assessment of the uh, human rights assessment of the 2019 general election is out as put together by NHRC as well as Horidak, uh, which is also a human rights organization. I'll be joined by a couple of them on the program this morning as we begin to explore that particular document and also uh, begin to dig deeper and ask questions about what transpired during the just concluded 2019 general elections. I'm joined now by Ayodele Amem, who is the executive director of the Human Rights Advancement, Development and Advocacy Center, Horidak. Thank you for joining us on the program this morning. Thank you, Nifeng. Good yeah. to be here. Paul Sinokeze is another human rights activist who joins us uh, this morning on the program. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Uh, glad to have you come. Uh, now, now, let's begin with a summary, trying to understand the summary of what you call the assessment, human rights assessment of the 2019 general election. According to that report, 176 people died in the 2019 general election. It's not far-fetched from what transpired uh, sometime in 1964-65 um, when we had our first uh, democratic election where about 200 people also died. Are you saying that not much of a progress has been made? Thank you very much, Nipemi. I think um, we have infused violence into our election going back to 1922. Okay? Now, in terms of the scope of our assessment, we have a stupid background because we, know, we must know how we got to this position. Mm. And we could discover that election after election, violence is becoming part and parcel of it. Now, most of those figures you are quoting from 1963 are those figures that are reported because there have not been subsequent way of documenting them like we are doing now. Now, but let's go far back to in terms of our work. We documented, um, we monitored the 2016 election in the Gambia, where only one person died. Not just only one person died, it's not good enough. And this actually an election that ousted a dictator, mm. okay? Then we move from there, we, we, we monitored the 2015 election, where we recorded more than 100 people dying. Now, that is even a conservative figure in terms of where we monitor it nationally where we now dig deep in terms of the commission of inquiry in River State to electoral infractions, we discover, because I was part of that commission as a technical expert, we discovered that 97 people were killed in River State alone in 2015. Mm. Now, coming to 2018 in Sierra Leone election, which we also have a, a database for the work we did there, six people died in the entire country for that election. Now, put that with 2019 election. So you could see that from 2015 to 19. Are you also 19, considering the population of these countries? Now, because, this, is, um, this is actually a major concern for us when people say that. Because are we saying that we need to kill more because we have more people? No, I'm just saying that quoting numbers might not be a true reflection of how violence free election has been in those areas. Because, for instance, if seven people had died in a country, it will also be seven par the number of people living in a particular space. Well, Uma, so we can begin to look at it from, you know, from the angle of ratio rather than just the angle of numbers. No, we do have percentages in the report, mm. but human rights um, guidelines do not support that assertion. Mm. Because there is no way we can explain to the family that lost their kid in your state and say to them, we only lose one or two people in a year. In fact, in rivers, they lost more. Mm. There's no way that we understand that. Mm. And, and I can shock you by even going to 2019 election in Senegal, mm. which have a bit of a population too, nobody died. I get your point precisely, yeah. but how do we also 
um, verify the credibility of your report. So this report is put together by the National Human Rights Commission uh, as well as the um, your organization, Ooh, Human Rights Advancement, Development and Advocacy Center. How many people did you put on the field? Um, how are we sure that your report is a true reflection of, what's actually, of what actually transpired during the election? Okay, um, during the election, we had some of our people as election observers, and we also worked with a lot of situation rooms like the TMG Transition Monitoring Group. Mm. We worked with the situation, women's situation room, the plaque situation room, clean, and the rest of them. And we also have gotten a lot of their own database mm. in terms of how the election was observed. But let me also make it clear that this report was solely Huridak database. But we just did a comparison with this other situation room uh, database. So we, before we put it into writing, we have made our own investigations. And uh, not to, to also add that, we also are aware of the media reports. So everything that is in this report has been verified with other situation rooms and what the media has provided us with, with what we also observed in the field in, during the days of the elections. So it's a huge document you have here, and I just want us to be able to summarize it such that the people can understand precisely what you have monitored during the election. So in, in the introduction, I see that you keep referring to previous elections in 1999, 2003, 2007, uh, but then not much was talked about in 2015. Uh, for instance, you mentioned that the, 20, the 2007 election is perhaps the worst election that this country you know, had put together. Are you saying that the previous election in 2015 was way better in terms of human rights protection relative to previous ones? Okay, thank you very much. Um, we resp we, in the chapter you are looking at, we are looking at the historical background of elections. Apparently. In looking at the human rights analysis, let me step back to explain what our scope of the, what the scope of the report is and what we are actually, because we didn't cover all human rights indicators. So we decided to focus on three, just three of it. One is unlawful killings. Mm. Then we have injuries, then we have destruction of properties. Under unlawful killings, we have three subsets. One is looking at extrajudicial execution. This is killing done by security operatives, anyone authorized by, the, you know, working for the government, okay? Okay, then, you're saying that your report did not capture uh, the process of voting, counting, collation, as it were? Because we have other situation rooms, other NGOs, okay. who monitor when the polling units open, I get your when it close. Mm. But we are only looking at the human rights aspect of it. And the advantage is this, if, if you use a human rights framework, to evaluate an election. Nobody's going to accuse you of biases, okay, or being pro one party or the other, okay. because you are assessing the election based on international standards, based on treaties that have been signed and ratified by the state government. Mm. For example, you have the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights that under Article 7 said, look, right to life in sacrosanct, okay? So if you are not killing people around the election, you are violating that, but also, we are not only looking at government security forces alone. We also look at other non-state actors. Mm. So in every, in our coverage of the election from our perspective, we are looking at extrajudicial execution. We are looking at politically motivated killings. These are killings from non-state actors, those who don't work for government. Mm. Thugs, hoodlums, what have you. Then you have what we don't have in 2015 that we have now is political related death. They are not actually killing. The intention is not to kill, but it leads to death because of political activities, like people who had accident on their way to a campaign uh, function, like uh, people who got suffocated in a campaign rally. So like um, um, attacks on villages on the eve of election to eat up the polity. Mm. So we put all those into consideration to come about those figures. Mm. Now, in terms of 20, 2007, 2015, 2015, we have a database, you know, for the election. In 2007, 2007 we don't have a database. I'm we, saying that, do we also know the figure precisely of those who died or who were killed in 2015, uh, such that we can, you know, now begin to compare if there's been an improvement in the past four years? Yes. Now, in the data we have, um, 
if I can just quickly refer to it. Now, when we put together all the information we have in 2015 in terms of total debt, we add it to the information we have in 2019 in terms of total debt, and we add it to that, a database in Syria alone, okay. just to do a comparison, mm -hmm. we discover that 59% of the entire data happened in 2019. Mm -hmm. And in 2015, you only have um, 39%, okay. while in Syria alone, only 2%. And when you try to look at this, this shows, um, in terms of the figure, which I can roughly give you now. Sorry, one minute. Yes, in terms of figure, we have 114 deaths in 2015. In Nigeria. In Nigeria. Okay. And we have 176 in 2019 mm -hmm. and six in Syria alone. Let's talk about... So you can see we're mm, negatively... We're going to get down to the details yeah. of all of these and, yeah. and why these keep being... Yeah. You know, why this has refused to leave us as a country. But how does this figure affect the credibility of the election? Because I understand that from this document, a free election is to the extent which, you know, that particular election facilitates the full expression of the, of the, of the political people. will of, of the, the people. people. Uh, would you say that as as um, discouraging as this figure is, does it rubbish the credibility of the 2019 election exercise? Thank you very much. You know, um, one thing this report has made us to see is that in Nigeria, we, we liken elections to be war. And um, people don't like war. So when you record this number of casualties in an election, it gives an increase to voter party. Mm. People who don't want to come and express their political will because there are questions like, are we safe? Am I sure I'll come back with my life? Just like the incident that happened in Oyo State. That young boy of 25 years old just came out to vote. He was not a political dog. He was not supporting any political party. But just on, on, at his polling unit, he was mm. shot dead. And his parents were just crying. So there are other cases like this. So if, if the question is if it affects the credibility of the election, I, I will say yes. Because we should not be recording deaths during election. We should not be recording injuries during, during an election. We should not be recording destruction of properties. If, if, if I know that an election within my area, my, my property, my shop, my car is at risk of death, getting burnt because I don't support a particular party, I have to take precaution before that time. Mm -hmm. and, and it will affect how I vote before, even before that time. So, so I, I think, yes, to an extent, it affects the credibility of the election. So, so I get your point that um, perhaps the will of the people could have been frustrated by the fear of um, losing property and indeed it's even not only that, having it's not only that their lives it. tampered with. Now, ask yourself, what is the incentive for government to deliver good governance? if they know they have other means to return to power. Now, the, the essence of focusing on the will of the people and the right to vote is because you, you have a situation where the people have to choose their leader. Mm. And if the leaders know that his fate is going to be determined by the people, solely by the people, in a free and fair election, he will do what the people want. He will produce, he will give good governance. It will give development. It will give all that. But if he knows that, okay, I need to push this billion of naira aside for the election because I'm not going to rely on the will of the people. So I'm going to use that money for vote trading. I'm going to use it to hire talks. I'm going, so that is one problem. Will it be? There's an additional mm. problem, if, I'm, if you allow me, okay. is that we are depriving ourselves of good people to serve us. Mm. You know, you will not join political parties if you are asked to sign your life away because you can be killed in an election. Nobody will do that. Mm. And people are watching. So no professional, no, you know, some people who really have what it takes to help the state, to help government, to deliver, to serve. We go into politics if this is the landmark. Mm. That means we have an electoral process that is painted with blood, tears, and sorrow. Will, no it, will it be absolutely accurate to say that the will of the people, you know, have not counted in the previous years? Because in, in that same document, you made mention 
of the transformation we've experienced in Africa in the past decade. Exactly. From Nigeria to Ghana to Syria alone, mm -hmm. the Gambia, where we have seen the opposition party win wow. elections. Uh, in 2015, for instance, it couldn't have been anything but the will of the people to have um, a sitting party lose a presidential election after 16 years. Good. Now, what is important that we need most note that what this report is saying? What is this point is saying that one death is too much? Mm. One injury is too much. Okay? Mm. Now, people will tell you, oh, but the election in Shokoto and some other places are peaceful. You know, we did well. For God's sake, elections are supposed to be peaceful. That is the norm. We don't need an honor badge for organizing a peaceful election. But it's a very serious concern if we are counting electoral statistics in terms of debt, injuries, and the social property. Don't forget, this thing we are talking about, they are not just numbers. Mm. These are human beings. These are their properties. You know, people that have been stabbed, people that have been killed, people that whose houses have been burnt, they are real. They are just beyond figures. And we are saying each of these cases need to be investigated by the police, and everybody find one thing must be prosecuted. The victim deserves justice mm. because they have not come into an election as a war participant. They have come into an election as a voter or as a politician. They should not be dying. Of course, the police made mention that over 700 people have been arrested aftermath of this election. Uh, sometime last year, we also saw two uh, staff members of INEC jailed for electoral offense. Yeah. Uh, we're hopeful that things will get better and that perhaps we were going to have examples for you know subsequent exercises. But earlier you made mention of the fact that the you know the fact that people died has really affected the credibility of this poll. Y your document also gave credence to the 1993 election as being perhaps the freest and fairest election that has ever been conducted. But do we also have the fact as regards whether that particular exercise was peaceful and no record of death, you know, no death was recorded? Well, um, we, it's, it's on record that that election was the freest and fairest of elections. And let me say that the, uh, our community today, we, we have succeeded in separating elections and human rights. Mm. Whereas um, elections, human rights is supposed to be the basis for which we organize elections. Now, in that election, there were, there were little or no records of what we are seeing today. Do you understand what I'm yeah. saying? It's, 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 the, 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 the situation is pathetic in, at this period. And, and you mentioned um, the police and what they've done. And let me, let me seize this opportunity to say that, like you said, the police are doing a lot. They are investigating a lot. But the, 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 the perception out there is that nothing is happening. Right. And from our investigations, we've discovered that it's not as if the police, they are not making investig investigations. It's not as if they are not making arrests. But in most cases, you find out that when these issues go to court, the attorney generals of the states put uh, a non nolly that is to say that for us as a state, we are not interested mm. in, in this case. M maybe because this case involves their party people, and the Attorney General is a party man. So one of the recommendations we are making is, what if, what if it to, to, to mitigate these crimes, these killings, destruction of properties that happen during the elections, what if we take these prosecutions outside the states? outside the country. Let, what if we take it to some, something like the International Criminal Court that can prosecute these people? Let's take it out of the parts of the state where to avoid these, some of these, I'm not saying all of them, but some of these attorney generals going out and saying we are not interested in this case. And, and that is why we, we feel that is why that um, we keep recycling elections, ev uh, uh, violence during every electoral period. For example, in, assuming in 2007, we jailed 2,000 uh, thugs that committed electoral violence, and they are still in jail. In 2011, it will be 2,000 less thugs 
in 2011. And after 2011, we jailed 2,000 more. Unfortunately, we can't jail them for that long, you know, based on the provision of the Electoral Act. And from what we've seen from our prisons, not many of them, you know, return to normal life better. So we haven't seen quality rehabilitation. You send a, th you send a thug to the prison, is likely going to come back, you know, worse than he was before. Some he, of them may not. The well, well, but from what we have seen, have you been to the prisons? Have you seen no, the no, fact no, we, that we, uh, we the do. prisons are overcrowded? I, I totally know that. But my point here is that... There are some who would say that um, perhaps if we make the positions less attractive, the fact that you become a politician today and the tide of your life changes forever, it makes it more, it makes people more desperate. You know, the kind of power they wield, the kind of influence they wield, the kind of economic power that, you know, they can just make happen in a minute. That that is why politicians are so desperate and that is why it is apparently practically impossible to reduce the number of deaths during an election. From the Umaya perspe perspective, mm. we kind of um, <clears throat> do not ascribe to that um, narrative, and I'll tell you why. Why is it that when the commoners become victims, we start to allude reasons to interrogate why the criminal is committing an offense? Mm. We don't actually do that with arm robbers. We don't have to do that with people who are in jail for stealing. We don't actually sit and have a discussion. Why is the armor about stealing? You know, the law is very clear. You kill somebody, that is murder. You should be tried for murder. So it is a crime in the statutory book, mm. irrespective of the electoral act. Okay? You injured person, it is a crime within the statutory book. And these two are actually also a violation of the international treaties that the states have actually ratified. So we cannot, whatever the system of electoral management that we adopt, one that thing that is clear is that the protection of all the participants in that electoral process is important. And those who commit infractions should be punished. In reality, when people get arrested, you arrest the foot soldiers. Mm -hmm. In reality, it's been practically impossible to get, you know, the the big man behind the curtain who have sent the guys out. Now, my point is, what has made it impossible to pick up the man behind the curtain is the kind of influence they wields. And until we perforate that, until until we don't, you know, until our leaders sit they stop sitting on the economy of this nation. We're not going to be able to wield power from them. You don't agree with me? Yeah, I, 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 I struggle to agree with you in terms of, I, I totally understand why what happened in the supplementary elections happened in Kano, okay? I totally understand why politicians fight for their life, okay? Because they strongly believe there is other ways of getting into power beyond the will of the people. Okay, if you have the people on your side, you don't really need talks. Mm. You don't need any other one to vote you into power. And the more we try to ascribe reasons why they are doing this, the more I think we need to just say it should stop. And it can only stop by addressing the impunity mm. around it. I understand the complications in terms of people waving influence, but the law does not ascribe to that. Everybody should be equal before the law. Whether you are a big politician, a small one, a non-politician, you are. So this lies on the police to actually find ways to address impunity. Because if you don't address impunity, then you are crossing the impunity bridge. Mm. That now make ordinary crimes a human rights violation of the state against the victims. And this can be addressed at the international level. So we are looking at every, all options with the Human Rights Commission to see how, but we are looking at two approach. One is what you are saying, that we need to make sure that the man behind this get punished. But at the same time, we need to look at it from the bottom top. How do you provide education for the youth of the political parties? If you look at our database, 16% of all the violence are only committed by the police and the security forces. 84% by non-state actors, politicians, their supporters, their sympathizers, what is the level of our investment on them? So it, it looks for the like police, I'm... you have had a lot of training, mm. human rights training, election training. For the political parties, we haven't. 
And that's why I say we need to start putting our investment in the political parties to actually stem this down. It looks like an unending circle. You yeah. want education, you want job for the youths, but then you have to elect quality, you know, government Definitely. who is going to make that happen. And then you also need a transparent electoral system to elect the kind of government that you need. But let us also begin to look at the role of the people, as it were. So to have your human right entrenched, number one, you must know it, and you also need to exercise it. Since 1999, the uh, voter turnout hasn't been quite impressive. Perhaps the highest figure we had was in 2003, when we had 69.1% out of 60 million registered voters. In 2019, the highest registered voters yet, 84 million, the highest number of political parties, but then the voter turnout is very poor. Over 40 million Nigerians who are their PVCs did not turn out to vote. So people would say it is easier to rig election, it is easier to, you know, trample on human rights when there is voter apathy. How do we fix this challenge? All right, thank you very much. Um, it's all about perception and um, we think the best way to go about it is education and sensitization. Okay, for example, it, during the, you, we, can all, we all noticed what happened during the presidential election and for the governorship election, it was the total oppos opposite of what happened during the yeah, presidential election. The question now is, what happened between that day of the presidential election and the day of the governorship elections. Yeah. Something must have happened that, 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 that facilitated voters' apathy for the governorship elections. And it's, it's a bridge of human rights. A lot of, a lot of factors which I wouldn't want to go into now happened. But, but the main thing is, the more people get sensitized, the more people get to know that we don't need to be bullied out of exercising our, our basic human rights. You know, even, even though it is not um, uh, outrightly stamped in our constitution, the rights to vote as one of the uh, basic human rights, but there are other acts that support the right to vote in our constitution. Now, we don't need to be bullied out of it. We don't need to be convinced out of it. We don't need, you, you, we, we don't need our votes. We don't need to sell our votes not to engage in these elections. So, so for, for the people, we need to get to that point where we understand that not coming out to vote is actually voting for the wrong person. Yeah. Because if you have the right candidates that you want to vote for, the person you feel will do, will achieve what you want the person to achieve, and you sit at home, you are automatically voting for this other person that will not give you the dividends of democracy. So, we also need to let people know that by, by, by doing that, then you have rid yourself of the right to complain. Mm. Because whatever you allow, you don't complain. Mm. So, so we, we want to go about it by sensitization, voters, education. Let the civil society get into the streets, get into the media, and let people know that we need to get to vote and exercise our vote and make sure that our votes count, regardless of whatever the political and the elite are doing, whatever the whatever state of the electoral commission. But let us make sure because if we don't vote, then the, if voters' apathy keep, keeps increasing, then I, I bet you that we may not get to that point where we we'll get the people that we actually want to rule us in this nation. The challenge remains how to make the, you know, make the electorate more resolute to vote against all odds. So in the 2019 election, for instance, there are states where the elections were postponed like twice. There was an initial postponement. There were times where there was supplementary election and all of that. Sometimes people just say, well, wh wh why should I stress myself? Especially when there are reports of violence here and there. Exactly. Uh, is it an impossible task? Well, it's a very difficult one. Now, let's look at it from another perspective. Now, what are the basic needs of an ordinary Nigerian? Okay? You want power, you want a house, he wants, good he wants water, he wants yeah. good words. He can't do good words himself, so he kind of survive and manage with that. Mm. But he got his own house, he has his own bore home, and he has his own generator for water. Mm. Then the question is why does he need the government? So 
You can see the implication of not delivering good governance and how it affects voting on one aspect. On the second aspect, whose responsibility is it to get people out there to vote? It's not INEC, mm. it's the political parties. Mm. Okay? And we start to start to think beyond the box and say, what do we do? And if you do an analysis of the voting pattern in 2019, actually those who are in the far, far rural area came out to vote. Major George, look at the northern state. They have a higher ratio of voters turnout than let's say for Lagos. Lagos is over five million votes. Recorded last less than a million. What went wrong that four million people didn't turn out? Who well, are expected to be elite. Exactly. Educated. Exactly. Mm. So it's not lack of education. They are elite, they are their own watching CNN. In some other country, I think Australia, if I'm correct, is compulsory you have to vote. Mm. You know? And don't forget, the policy of the next government is going to affect the elite more than the rural man in, um, in Cancina, mm. you know, who doesn't mm. have interaction with government is limited. That's right. But those whose policy of the state we affect are now saying, no, you know, in some other countries you get fined for not going to vote, mm. you know? So we now have a government that roughly about half of the people that are supposed to vote for it actually voted. Mm. So you can have a government where minority are voting to elect a government that will govern over the majority. Apparently. It's a point of concern mm. and it's a point of worry, not only for society or for the media, even for INEC themselves. This is challenging. Apparently, our leaders in the past years have emerged not by... This is challenging. Apparently, our leaders in the past years have emerged not by majority of vote of the people, but majority of those who came out to vote. To vote, exactly. exactly. Let's take a break here. When we return, we'll turn our attention to the right to vote. Another interesting thing in that document is the fact that the right to vote is not covered by Section 4 of the 1999 Constitution. We we'll also uh, touch on uh, voter trading, which uh, seemed to have become the norm in, in, in our election, and uh, as well as opening the phone lines for you to participate. Do join us again. Glad to have you back. We're reviewing the, the 2019 election human rights assessment as put together by the NHRC as well as the Human Rights Advancement, Development and Advocacy Center. Uh, they say 176 people lost their life in the just concluded 2019 general election. It is a huge infringement on human rights and according to them, it indeed affects the credibility of that exercise. Hayodele Amin and Paul Sinokezie, thank you for staying the course on, on the program this morning. All right, so it's interesting to see, according to your document here, that uh, despite the status given to the right to vote uh, on the international scene, and even though Nigeria seemed to have ratified these international instruments, it's um, eye-opening to note that the voting rights in Nigeria are not guaranteed on the Chapter 4 of the Constitution, which stipulates the fundamental rights that accrue to every Nigerian citizen. Um, how, what makes that important? Was it deliberate to have omitted it? Even though some would say the Electoral Act do mention that and um, other, other you know, important acts as well. What are your thoughts about this? I think it's just a matter of timing. I think human rights try to involve. And if you can recall, we started uh, working on human rights by focusing on negative rights first. Mm. Looking at things like do not torture, do not kill, and all this kind of thing. And later it moved into economic, social, and cultural rights. Mm. I think, and if you look at it, the chapter four was adapted before the right to vote becomes a kind of fundamental right at the international forum. But despite that, um, Nigeria is the state party to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Mm. And that, uh, do, that um, particular uh, treaty is do domesticated, uh, domesticated in Nigeria. And 
there are, there are a lot of, because look, right to vote is a, is a, is a pregnant right. That is how we are pregnant. It includes things like freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom of movement, which all are captured under chapter four of the constitution. The, does the freedom of expression covers, covers the, the, the right to vote? Because when, to an extent, it is you, you know, upholding or expressing your opinion, your political opinion as yeah. it were. Of course it does. Mm. It's also, under that, it's also, we also look at um, harassment of journalists. You know, the right to vote try to give some protection to, uh, to opposition party, not the incumbent party, but the opposition party, who are defenders, journalists, mm. and other, other stakeholders involved in the electoral process. Let's explore the role that the military played in the 2019 election. Um, I'm glad that you were at the Gambia. And um, it's an established fact that the military seem to have helped to, you know, project the kind of um, democratic values we've seen in the past couple of years. In Nigeria in 2015, when the opposition, you know, won election, as some would say that the, the elections were heavily, you know, militarized. I mean, militarized. And that is why people could really, really express their rights at the poll. Would you say the same thing happened this year? Well, um, let's get something clear. The military, they are not the security institution that should oversee an election. Mm. That's the sole responsibility of the police. The military has entirely no business with elections. But you, you find some people arguing that without the intervention of the military in the 2019 elections, that a lot of things would have gone out of hand yeah. because that the police couldn't handle it. As much as we would want to, as much as personally I would want to agree with that narrative, but what we are saying is what is right That's and right. what is wrong. The military, we don't see, to an extent with our experiences, we've not seen the military with um, the police has a lot of human rights um, uh, barriers, or, or, or let me say, they have a lot of human rights trainings in terms of when they are going about their responsibilities and duties. But we, we may not, I may not say the same for the military, because they, 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 for, for, for some people say it's, it's obey the last command. Mm. So, so we, 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 I would not stand here to say that the military's involvement in the 2019 election helped the election, the turnout of the elections, or that it did not help the turnout of the election. But come on, we saw, we, we saw the things that happened in River State with the military and some, some hoodlums in River State. And there are a lot of narratives around it. But the fact still remains that the military has no business with elections. Presidential, governorship, houses of assembly, elections, they have no business. They, but it is the sole responsibility of the police. So what we need to be saying now is how do we, how do we build the capacity of the police to make sure that they ensure the safety of lives and properties during the elections as they are supposed to. And we, we, not, we, and we do not longer ha have to start looking at bringing in the military. If, if the police have been able to do their jobs, we wouldn't have um, uh, issues of, of bringing the military in. So how do we make sure that the police work and function the way they are supposed to, mm. with credibility that every one of us will be at peace and we know that the police have us at their hands? I get a point. So the military and the police had the press briefing a couple of um, days ago, acknowledging that, well, some of their... Uh, uh, people could have been culpable in the many allegations that trailed the 2019 general election. What should be the next step? Are you expecting to see those found culpable prosecuted, you know, seven as deterrents for future, future exercise? Okay, yeah. I think um, we, will be, we are very hopeful that that will happen. But let's deepen the discussion much more. Mm. <clears throat> in the first instance, um, we are aware, like my colleague said, the military have no business. We, we monitor the Ekiti election in 2014, and we can see how militarized that election is. But we do something positive after that. We went to the ECOWAS court. We took the army to the ECOWAS court in terms of the fact that 
their action in the AKT is against the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. So it is good to have the submission of the army. You Has know? that case been concluded? Well, that cake was true at, at some point. Okay. Okay. Because don't forget that in 2014, those in power were not the people in power when the case came up mm. in 2016. Mm. Okay. okay. So, so basically, but the point is that the time start to realize what the requirement, what the standard are from our submission. And we can see a sharp difference in 2015 that the election is not as militarized as... So what we're having now is, retro, is, is retrogressing back to that, which is not something that is encouraging. But if you look at our Sierra Leone report, um, we have a chapter on policing the police that police the election. And you can start to see why the police also need to have a de department for election management under the police, mm. so that the police don't do go to bed after the election and wake up in 2023 to say, okay, guys, what are we going to do? Because the lot of work the police have in protecting life and property, in working with political parties, in measuring that laws and order are obeyed during the election. It's not something that we can just do with adventure or we can just do with a kind of uh, election uh, tourism. It's something that has to be embedded in police operation and have a department mm. that will be in charge of that. And the complication is this. One, you have an IG that have an overall command for the entire police. Then you have the president who is a candidate in an election that is the commander in chief. Okay? Now, Let me hold you for a minute to take this caller from Akeja. Good morning, Nelson. Good morning. Uh, glad to have you on the program. Please go ahead with the contribution. Yes, uh, my contribution is that one, we must recognize the fact that the free, fair, and credibility of an election can only be guaranteed when all the stakeholders play their role, you know, as they shine, you know, constitutionally. But unfortunately, we have seen a repeated occurrence of uh, uh, some people who are helping, you know, on playing out, you know, the culture repeated to us by former President Kodusha Gobat on just the do or die philosophy. And for me, in as much as I commend the, the speaker there on that day on your platform who has uh, who are taking the things to itemize issues of uh, electoral violence which i believe you know is very very instructive for every stakeholder to take home and go and reflect and see how we can you know make the better of our democracy because uh, when democracy operates in a time where there's intimidation where there's fear where there's threat to lives and property i don't think that you know, if that is in tandem with the definition or tenets of democracy globally. So by and large, I want to commend the work they have done. But I know that what the URI that or it was the name of the organization he mentioned that you represent, what they have done so far, it's one that you know we should all take hold and see how we can, you know, build on those uh, achievements and correct the lapses because even the INEC uh, uh, the national chairman, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, also identified that, look, immediately this election is over, there's a need for us you know, to have a roundtable to discuss some issues because, Apparently. like, we can't continue, you know, we can't continue to assault humanity with our conduct uh, in which an uh, election has become a do and die affair. I think you made a point, so, Nelson. Thank you yeah. very much for calling in. On one hand, we're saying, uh, Paulson said, it's important for us to improve the quality of police such that they won't need aid or support from the military. On the other hand, we're saying military should not intervene. Do we have a police that is capable to manage, you know, the, to, to police election in this country? Okay, now let me make a very quick clarification. Even police themselves, they are not electoral officers. Hmm. They are only there to maintain law and but order. But they are a critical stake I understand. at uh, keeping yeah. peace and ensuring that I the totally understand is that. Now, the reason why I want to make that clarification is because they are not part of the people that make decisions on elections. Mm. They are only there to actually ensure a peaceful environment for election. And this is the complaint of INEC. Mm. INEC does not have the obligation or the power to provide a peaceful environment for election. INEC only needs to come in and organize and manage and the election. the process. Yeah. So if the security forces are unable to provide the peaceful environment, then that's a problem for INEC. And the security forces will say on their own side, we want to produce, 
to have a peaceful environment for election, mm. but if the politicians are behaving in a way that is making that impossible. So you can see all these three stands make things extremely difficult in terms of having a peaceful election. And that is why that within this three um, strand, the political parties need a lot of investment to understand the implication of the action. I don't think they will do for now. It's all right. Um, let's talk about um, the, the, the management body, INEC. So you heard um, Nelson say that Chairman INEC had said that after this election, there's a need to sit down and review the process and talk about the challenges. Uh, the conversation and the debate is still on whether INEC is truly independent. Did your report capture the independence of the electoral body during this exercise? Well, we, we believe INEC is independent. And um, like my colleague said, there are a lot of issues around what INEC does. Mm. And talking about the way forward, we, yesterday we had a discussion with the National Human Rights Commission on what post-election steps and strategies. And of course, INEC, they are a, a big part of the people that we we'll sit down together with and have these discussions with. For example, we need to start engaging with the political parties more, especially the youth wings of these political parties. Because that is if they are truly run by youth. So you see some 60-year-old, 70-year-old. <laughs> no, you know, you know when, we, when we talk about political, when, you, when, you, when we talk about political the political parties, uh, parties mm -hmm. and their youth, youth wing, don't, we, we don't um, excuse or we don't remove the uh, National Union of Road Transport Workers okay. because they are also part of these people. Either they, 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 are, they are part of the drivers for INEC or they are part of the drivers for some of these political parties. So, so we, it, it's, it's widespread. And... Um, we, we also feel INEC has a lot, she has a lot to do. Because if you, if you have uh, a, a police that is telling you that, yes, our work is to ensure a, a, a safe environment for you to work. And you also have political parties who is making the work of the police very, very difficult for you to work. Mm -hmm. You find out that it is now a case of these are the elephants and you are the grass. Because by the time the police are not able to do their uh, activities, carry out their activities very well because of the activities of these political parties and their supporters, you, every blame will fall back to you as not being able to conduct the election the way it, is, it was supposed to be conducted. Yeah. So uh, we feel, if, as, as, when, when you talk about the independence of INEC, we, we, we feel INEC is independent because when you have a situation where the ruling party is accusing INEC of something and the opposition party is accusing INEC of something and several other parties are... So you, you, you ask yourself, so who is INEC supporting? So when we get that narrative, you find out that INEC, they are just at the middle because they are facing the, 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 the bullets from here, they are getting it from here. And, they are, and when you look at what has happened in Zamfara, Rivers, and what INEC has actually come out to say, you find out that INEC truly... You think that it's faring better as regards independence? Of course. I hope that um, every other stakeholder can agree as touching that. But let's talk about vote trading, uh, one of the <laughs> issues captured in, in, in your document. So we've seen it evolve from offering money at the polling units to transferring money to voters. So I spoke with the chairman of the FCC like two days before the election, and he mentioned that officials of the AFCC are going to be represented at the polling unit. As we speak right now, we understand that some people are being prosecuted. But how effective do you think that really is? And how much of it did you monitor during the election? I mean, did you see happen? Okay, we need to deepen the discussion again about, mm -hmm. so that people can understand the concept of it, how we move from vote buying to vote trading. To vote trading. Because it's not just about buying votes. Mm -hmm. People voluntarily and openly negotiate mm. to sell their vote, okay? Now, we need to step back a little and look at where this has been coming from. Not too long, let's check the political parties and their primaries. Do we have evidence of vote trading in that? Mm. Yes, of course, because you have primaries election where you have allegations of people buying votes 
of delegate. So you have that. <clears throat> and then you now go to the wider society where the commoners think we have lost out with the political parties. We are not going to see these elected officials anyway for the next four years. It's going to Abuja or it's going to the capital city. Mm. So the only thing we could get for him now, because we have, it's now that we have an electoral value. Okay, to him, to the politician, we have an electoral value. And the only thing now is to get and latch on those electoral value because it's not going to come back anyway. Mm. So you have that kind of connotation. And, but those are dangerous narrative. Mm. Because at the end of the day, it seems that people are, don't care about good governance. Mm. And why wouldn't they care about good governance? Because they have seen so many bad governance that they think is the norm. And good governance becomes like a mirage that will never happen. So why should they believe in it? So there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of that. Then secondly, it's also looking at the legal aspect of this. It's against the electoral law. I had a, a kind of discussion with my legal director, Barrister Kazim, and he said, look, we can go to court. We can take people to court to say, OK, uh, he bought my vote. But the accused can present 10 other people that they gave the same money to, mm. to say, and they will say it's for refreshment, mm. that you misunderstood. Because in this vote trade, there is no receipt <laughs> that shows that I paid you and I'm paying for your vote. But let's even look at it, that even if people receive money, does that force them to change their notion? We have had somebody that says, OK, I wanted to vote for this party, and they gave me money. It doesn't change my mind. Mm. So it's a very difficult area that INEC is looking at, That's all right. civil society is looking at, mm. and I think the police needs to look into this, EFCC should look into this, because it's a dangerous trend that will derail our entire electoral process, because it becomes a money bag issue. Mm. If I can buy 3,000 votes or 100,000 votes, I will win. That shouldn't be the basis of electing people to offices. There's a lot to talk about. Your assessment of the 2019 general election is inexhaustible on this program. Yeah. But there's the issue of the judiciary and election. So yeah. fortunately or unfortunately, many of these 2019 elections are still going to be decided by the court. But up until two or three days before election, we still see courts give order as regards whether a party was going to participate or a candidate was eligible or not. Do, do you think that is a development that should be welcomed? Or should we begin to fight in a system where long before the voting exercise, all of these issues would have been set to that, the court? Thank you very much. You know, before now, um, we've had serious issues with our judicial system in Nigeria in terms of how long it takes for justice to be served. Mm. Um, and what happened before the elections is a very, very sorry situation for our country, Nigeria. But the fact still remains that justice can, can, is good when it's given. It may be delayed, but let it not be denied. That's the fact. So, so Sometimes, justice delayed is as good as justice denied, denied. especially <laughs> in a four-year tenure where... Mm. You know, there are people who have eventually won elections in court, but then time, time has, you know, events have overtaken the reality of those, of those, of those of elections. Of course, of course. Mm. Um, we, we are, I'm not here to give the judiciary a thumbs up. Mm. The truth about it is what happened with the judiciary, Zamfara, Rivers, if, if I were INEC, I would, be, I would be plunged into a state of confusion. Because which do I, for, okay, like the case of Zanfar, uh, three, three courts, three mm -hmm. different courts give three different verdicts. That's right. If, uh, I, on, on, if I can just add to that, mm -hmm. there is something in the law that talk about democracy by the court. And at the end of the day, do we have to blame judiciary? Mm -hmm. People took cases to them. And they it's, have to. It, it's still the politicians. They have to attend to them. Because what you need mm -hmm. to do as a politician, some of the do is that they contest an election, they know they are not going to win, okay? And they go to court afterward. Okay, and start looking at the effort they should have invested in making sure they get people to vote for them. Mm. They start saying, okay, we go to court, we try and do this, or they kind of bribe their way, get declared, and now say the opponent should go to court 
Well, I mean, power. Gentlemen, so it's a big issue. We have to go now, but but I also need you to know that there are a lot of reports and assessments, yeah. uh, and it's interesting that there are even contradicting assessments uh, yeah. from non-governmental organizations. But I must thank you uh, very kindly for joining us on the program, and congratulations on the great work that you've done. Yeah. Ayodele Amin is Executive Director of the Human Rights Advancement, Development, and Advocacy Center, Horadak, and Paulson Okeze is a human rights activist who also joined us. I believe your program director uh, uh, of Horedak. That's our show today. Can We're, I just that it's please available do. online. Online. On our website. So you can download um, the report. 2019, uh, human rights assessment of 2019 general election. We'll be back tomorrow, God willing, with another exciting edition. I am Nifa Mugutoya. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.